Good evening, everyone. My name is Tiffany Stewart Stanley. I'm the Director of External Affairs for the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. Thank you so much for joining us for the 2020 Douglas County Mental Health Virtual Forum hosted by Douglas County Vice Chairman and Commissioner Kelly Robinson. Um, we're so excited to have you here today. We're continuing our work that we've been doing in Douglas County, focusing on helping our citizens who have behavioral health issues in our county. Um, this, this forum is just one of many forums we've had over the years. This is Commissioner Robinson's fifth forum, Behavior Health Mental Health Forum, that he's hosted during his tenure as a commissioner for Douglas County. So we're excited to have a great panel with us this evening to discuss behavioral health issues, which include mental health issues and substance abuse issues in Douglas County. At this time, I will, we will hear from Vice Chairman Commissioner Kelly Robinson to give us some words of welcome and to share his vision for tonight's forum. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Director Tiffany Stewart Stanley. Greetings, citizens. Um, I am Kelly Robinson, and I'm, I'm humbled to be here tonight. Um, as Director Tiffany Stewart Stanley stated, this has been a five-year journey, and I, I'm going to start out with a story, and I, I think that's important. Um, five years ago, uh, I've got a, an inbox from a citizen um, on Facebook, and she pretty much said, Commissioner Robinson, you really need to consider mental health in Douglas County, to which I didn't reply. Didn't know her, real cautious about responding to people on Facebook, but nonetheless, she was persistent. A few weeks later, she called me back, you know, hit me up again. I decided to read her what she wrote, and I decided to call her. She began to share her story. She talked about how she watched and saw her mother commit suicide at 19. Mm-hmm. And she talked about how uh, in that experience that for two years, uh, for two years uh, her behavior went to the right. It, it wasn't in the light. And she talked about how she got in trouble and wound up being in state prison for 21 years. And she talked about how she didn't get the help that she needed. And had she got the help, she might have been not been the place that she was. So she, her, her story was so strong and so poignant. And it, it, it hit my spirit. And it made me back up and think about, like, okay, mental health is not just that person's issue or that person's issue. It's everywhere. It's not a partisan issue. It's not a race issue. It's, it's not a, an American issue. Mental health is everyone's issue. It can be seen in your own household. It can be seen in your subdivision. It can be seen in your community. But with that said, I backed up and said, okay, but what will I do it? What will I do about it as a legislator? Again, I'm not um, obviously the top person here. And as a legislator, all I can do is advocate for what I think is important. Obviously, being the commissioner of District 2, that has a certain limitation. But this is something that I so believed in that I, I, I set out to try to find people to get behind this. And I, I began to reach out to um, Judge Bo McLean, who was, who, who was very receptive, because at that time during 2015, that was when Governor um, Nathan Deal began to do his criminal justice reform out of Hall County with his son. And it began to take off. So the timing was perfect. And so here I am in Savannah, and I'm at a conference, and I'm going to a criminal justice reform class. And in that class is about 400 of federal commissioners. And we're sitting there, and they're talking about criminal justice reform, and they're talking about how the state has gotten to a place where they can no longer build prisons. They've got to give alternative sentencing options. Now, this woman is in my spirit, in my heart, and I'm listening to this, and the timing was like us. I think the time is now. So I came back immediately home. The very next month, I was in Sweetwater State Park, and I began to advocate for this with Roger Bruce's Catfish Rodeo, State Rep. And it was one of those where I believe that this was so important that everybody needed to hear about this. So I set out to set up a panel discussion. This is back in 2015. I, I believe at this one, uh, you had State Judge Fortner came by. Though I think he was, might have been a solicitor, not even a DA yet. Um, votes. I got four votes. I didn't just get four votes. I got five votes. So what I have to thank is the full board of commissioners, specifically the prior administration with Tom Morgan and Mike Mulcair. Obviously, without their support, this would not have gotten done as the chair and the vice chair. 
Madam Jones Guider, thank you. Commissioner Mitchell, there's nothing I can do without you. But obviously, with the new administration, Madam Chair, thank you for allowing the administration to take this up. Because obviously, I know my lane is in District 2, but for this to be countywide, I cannot ask for any other support. And Madam Carson, thank you for joining us, joining us and carrying this forward. So this is our fifth year. Again, hopefully this program, as an outcome, I set out three things. I want to focus on prevention. I want to focus on intervention. And for five years, we've been driving home awareness. And hopefully tonight, it'll be a call to action. So I'm within my five minutes, uh, which is normally beyond my normal three minutes. But nonetheless, uh, I have not seen this, this trailer of this documentary. And I really believe it's going to be very good for us. And we're going to get into this panel. So without any ado, uh, Madam Tiffany Stewart Stanley, please take over. And citizens, again, I bring you greetings. And I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay, I apologize. So yes, thank you, Commissioner Robinson. And at this time, I would like to remind all of our panelists to please mute your microphones if you are not speaking right now. Um, also at this time, I'd also like to acknowledge our Director of Communications and our Assistant Director of Communications, Rick Martin and TJ Jaglinski for streaming this live on the Douglas County Happenings Facebook page and DCTV 23. We really appreciate you helping to get this word out to the community about the Behavioral Health um, Forum. So at this time, Commissioner Robinson mentioned uh, the behavioral health documentary. We have, um, we decided, Commissioner Robinson decided that he wanted to get the word out about what's going on in Douglas County as far as the resources. And he wanted the people in Douglas County to get a feel for who is actually in Douglas County doing the work, getting the word out. And he came up with this great idea to do this video. Now, what you're going to see is a very shortened version of the video. We wanted to respect everyone's time tonight and give everyone time for the panel. So you're just going to see a 15-minute, kind of like mini documentary. This uh, mini video was hosted by Kimberly Massey, and it has a, a, a gamut of people on the video, and we're so thankful that everyone joined us for the video. Um, so at this time, I will attempt to share this video on my screen. I am asking all participants during this time to please mute your microphones.
It's black. Oh my God. Okay. I apologize. Apparently the screen is showing black. Hold on one second, everyone. Okay, tell me if you see it. Tell me if you see it now. It's it's just if you see it. Okay, I'm I'm just going to. Okay, so we're going to have to come back to the video. I, I tested it. I don't know why it's not showing right now. Um, so what we will do is we will go ahead and start with our uh, panelist intro. We will start with Dr. Alwyn Tart. We will give you, Dr. Tart, one minute to uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Okay. My name is Dr. Aldwan Tart. I am a Christian clinical psychologist. What that means is that I am cross-trained as a minister as well as a clinical psychologist, helping you to apply application to the word. I specialize in helping families, marriages, and children to have better relationships. I'm a native of Atlanta, Morehouse grad, University of Michigan graduate as well, and I've been a psychologist for 20 years, and I'm glad to be here. Alrighty, thank you. And then next we'll hear from Dr. Pamela Thompson. Hi, I'm Dr. Pam Thompson, and I'm a clinical psychologist with a faith-based practice. And so my specialty is the integration of my clinical skills and knowledge with a biblical worldview. And I've owned and operated Building Bridges to Better Lives in Southwest Atlanta since 2004. I work primarily with adults and couples and women in particular is uh, women's issues is an area that I concentrate in. I have written a book called Surviving Mama, which is about overcoming strained mother-daughter relationships. I work with married and premarital couples, and I am the host of a podcast that is known as Intentionally Free where we look at real issues for real people and offer real answers, real hope, real solutions. And that's who I am. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. And next we'll hear from Munray Lightford, the director of the Douglas County Community Services Board. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Ray Lightford. I am the director of Douglas County Community Services Board. Uh, we are one of 27 Tier 1 safety net providers here in Georgia. Um, on average, we service about 5,000 citizens uh, per year here in Douglas County. Uh, we focus primarily with behavioral health, uh, substance abuse, and addiction issues, as well as we focus on the social economical issues that fall on housing, um, uh, supported employment, uh, peer support as well. It is a delight to be here, and thank you for having me. And next we will hear from uh, Morgan Cannon from the Douglas County School System. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Morgan Cannon. I'm a school psychologist um, with DCSS. Um, I've actually been a school psychologist in Douglas County since, um, I think, 2012. Uh, I currently serve two elementary schools and one middle school. 
So in a nutshell, school psychologists typically spend um, the majority of our time assessing students um, for special education services, um, but we also provide um, both individual and group counseling to students in need. Um, we consult with um, school staff, um, and we ultimately strive um, to help each and every child be successful, both academically, behaviorally, and socially. Um, so that's basically in a nutshell, and I'm excited to be here tonight as well. All right, thank you, Morgan. So in order to get the uh, conversation started tonight, we are going to focus on the family. We uh, have Dr. Alwyn Tart with us tonight, and um, as he's told you, he is a psychologist. You may have seen him on CNN, HLN, and um, in, um, on a lot of different channels and different um, media forums. So, Dr. Tart, um, if you will get ready, we're going to start with our questions for you. Uh, we know that right now a lot of families are going through a lot. Um, with COVID-19, um, being at home, being away from, you know, their, you know, their jobs and their friends and, and, and everything that they're used to doing. What uh, are some easy steps that families can take right now to self-counsel? All right. One, scheduling quality time with one another. While a lot of people are off work, there are a lot of people that are working more hours than ever. If you're in healthcare, if you're in mental health, if you're in essential services, you run your own business, you might be finding yourself working more hours than you did before. So scheduling quality time with one another. Uh, two, make sure that you're saying positive things to one another. You'd be surprised how many times you can be in a family and not know what your worth is because you just are not, uh, you have not been trained to actually say positive things about one another. We call those affirmations. We, we call those, you know, sharing fondness and admiration. Uh, three, doing activities to support each family member during uh, COVID-19. So that means that every member of the family should feel included. There are times in which my wife and I, my oldest daughter, have to do what our four-year-old wants her to do so that she can feel special. And there are times in which they have to watch a certain movie I want and rotate. So it's important in families, while we're spending this time sheltered in, and this should continue even afterwards, that we're doing and scheduling family versus allowing the world to kind of intrude on our family time. And I'll, I'll, res, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more. Basically, what's happening is that before and even now, we have work, uh, church, uh, school activities, uh, friends and family, video games, this phone, intrude on quality time for families. Where you can find families together actually all looking at their phone and not connecting. So my biggest advice is to use this time while you are sheltered in or whatever your situation is to really strengthen your family bond by scheduling quality time. It should be on the calendar, uh, doing activities that support each family member and saying positive things to one another to affirm one another. And the last thing, re resolve conflict peacefully. The goal is to hear and feel the conflict versus persuading and argue. So make sure that you resolve conflict peacefully. We expect families to, to disagree. And there's a thing called necessary conflict. And sometimes you have to have conflict to make sure that you set your boundaries and that you're heard. The conflict is not the problem. It's making sure that you have a process in place in reserving and resolving that conflict peacefully. All right, you are, right now you're muted. Sorry. So what are some of the main things that you said? Oh, I was lip syncing though. I was reading. I, I, I got a gist. I know you said main call. You can, you can lip sync. <laughs> but what, what, what I want to know is what are some of the things right now, especially during COVID-19, that cause some mental illness within the different family dynamics? Okay. Right, I'll tell you the biggest one. The biggest, the biggest little couple, stress. All right, stress from changing dynamics, whether you're trying to figure out what to do with your job, how to pivot with your career when you're going back to work, what that means economically. So stress is up there. The second one is the co-occurring pandemic that no one's talking about, mm -hmm. which is loneliness. Loneliness. All right, we're getting research coming in left and right and numbers coming in that people are reporting record highs in loneliness. The last numbers I saw 
somewhere around 49% of single men, 46% of single women reporting spike loneliness. But the numbers, even in relationships and families, are spiking because many of us know you can be in a relationship and are in a family and still feel alone. So it's important that you reach out. And this is really, really, really important if, you call, if you're an introvert and you've relied on going to the gym and you've relied on going to work for your connection, you've relied on going to church, you've relied on social activity. Not all those things are gone. So now you actually have to be pro-social. You actually have to use social media, use your phone, use uh, Microsoft Hangouts, use Zoom, use FaceTime, use WhatsApp to actually get on the phone and connect with people. And, and this is this is true not only for adults, but my wife and I had a, a serious conversation and actually got our primary care physician on the phone about when to return our four-year-old back to school because she it is a uh, it's a big age gap between, you know, our oldest and youngest, and she's lonely and missing her friends. We're actually more worried about her sadness, her anxiety. She's saying she doesn't have any friends. She doesn't understand why she can't go back to school. She sees other kids when we go to the walking trail. She tries to run to them. We grab her. And I know there are other families experiencing the same thing. So the main thing that we're looking at right now is stress because of the changes at work and, and being in the same house and having to work through all those different obstacles at the same time. Parents are having to work and and child care. And I, can I preach for a minute? Teach because the, 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 the teachers are just sending assignments. And now you having to, I'm having to be a four year old teacher and a teacher eighth grader. Math is very hard and work at the same time. And so a lot of couples are and families are going through that. So make sure that you know you're taking time for yourself. Uh, you're talking about stress, making the necessary adjustment, and also making sure that for your young ones as well as your teenagers, middle schoolers, you're talking to them about how to overcome loneliness by doing appropriate social distancing, uh, riding bikes, getting on the phone, doing Zoom calls, getting them together. So I think that's, that's probably the biggest cause and, and, and families really need to be in tune with and talk to their teens and one another about how to deal with stress and prevent loneliness. Yes, I, I completely understand because when you're used to going, I see you're doing it right now. I hey, I'm saying and having friends and going to stores and things you can't do. So I, I completely understand that. So my last question is, within the family dynamic, what is the single most imperative skill that families can use to just try to maintain harmony within the family? What are some things that they can do to make sure that? You know, even though we're going through these tough times, that, that that we're trying to be harmonious and we're trying to get along, what are some things that families can do? All right. A couple of things. One, just remember that love is spelled T-I-M-E. Love is spelled with time. You, you have to actually invest time in your family. You have to be have time for your husband, for your wife, for your partner. You have to have time for your kids, not only as a collective, but individually. So you want to make sure that you actually schedule it. It's so easy for us to come home and be on webinars and be on conference calls and planning family reunions and dealing with this. And then we look up, we don't have consistent family time. And so the way we build harmony is by being in tune. If we think about it as a radio, uh, a radio station, you want to be in tune with what's going on with your son. You want to be in tune with what's going on with your partner. You need your partner to be in tune with what's going on with you. So you need to be in, you need to be able to name the instruments, name the song that they're feeling, and be able to connect. So structure that. You'd be surprised how many couples and how many families we actually have them pull out their smartphones and schedule family time. So that means at eight o'clock, no phone calls come in. We're not doing Netflix. We're not doing Facebook. We're not on Instagram. We're not on webinars. We're not watching TV. We're actually sitting down at eight o'clock. And we're checking in with one another and having family time. One of the things that we've instituted during COVID-19 is family game night, where we're playing board games at night. It's a, it's a way to integrate everyone. And then also going on walks with different members of the family. So I take a walk with my wife, where our oldest watches the youngest. And then we come back and I play with the youngest. And then the oldest, we go outside and play volleyball. And so there are times when they sit down and, and, and Lord help my family, they watch Star Wars. Because I'm a Star Wars fan, all right? <laughs> And so we're doing things together. So it's that consistent quality time. And the second thing is mutual concern. 
Mm-hmm. See, in a family, it's not just about how we feel as parents. It's not just about how you feel as a husband or a wife. You actually have to have mutual concern about how the family feels about you. So there should be a check-in and say, how are things going with me? I sat down with my four-year-old and asked her, was I being a good buddy? Because she told me earlier that I didn't want to play with her because I was doing work while she wanted to play. And she started to cry because now I'm the primary playmate. My wife and I are the primary playmates in addition to her big sister. All right. How do we make up for 18 kids she used to play with (laughs) on a regular basis and dance class and all the things that now all of them are gone. And so I asked her yesterday, did I do a good job of being a good buddy because we went outside and played? And she said yes. So I had to make sure that I was checking in with her. I have to have mutual concern. So those are the two things that I think we all can do as families to make sure that we have harmony. If I add one more thing, asking and giving family, everyone in the family permission to say ouch. All right. So so you can say ouch. So ouch means you did something to hurt my feelings. Right. All right. Uh, my, my daughter, oldest daughter used this most recently. I was talking to her and then Trinity started crying. I guess our youngest one. So I went in to see, to see Trinity and my oldest said, ouch. So we were in the middle of talking and because she started crying, you left the conversation. Right. This happened so much. And so I said, you know, as soon as I settle her down, I'm going to come back and revisit the conversation that we're having. And that's important that when any, anytime someone in a family feels hurt, mm-hmm. we should stop and address it. Just like in a football game, if a football player, a basketball player gets hurt, they stop the whole game in attention to the play. If we use that analogy with our families that we care about your feelings and we'll stop and express concern, I think we can maintain harmony. Well, thank you, Dr. Spart. I think you, you gave us some really good suggestions. I know walks with my family have been very helpful during this time. But you also brought up a good point about people hurting, and that kind of leads me into my next segment with Dr. Pamela Thompson. So we're going to ask her to join the conversation now. And so we're going to talk about um, women right now, and there are a lot of adult women and women at home right now um, who may be who may be experiencing uh, domestic violence or a sort of violence from a partner. Um, we do have some statistics that show that 35% of Georgia women and 39% of Georgia men experience intimate partner physical violence, physical violence or stalking. So, Dr. Thompson, thank you for being here with us again. So, based on the statistic that I just stated, um, it is especially with COVID-19 going on the last two months, what is the effect that COVID-19 is having on domestic violence? So I know that the data on that, of course, is still going to be coming in because we're we're still in the middle of the storm. So we don't have all the information, but it's not rocket science to understand that women are at risk and that women who are already in a marriage or a relationship where violence was a part of the equation or angry outbursts or threatening gestures, uh, it's not rocket science to understand that they're really at risk today in this unprecedented era. Uh, There's nothing like isolation and being cut off from family and friends and and work outlets and financial outlets to put a woman more at risk when she has a a violent partner. So I I think one of the things that women can do who are stuck in this situation with no, seemingly no way to escape is that this is a good time for people to simply renew their minds now that the whole world has to be still this is a good time for women to do some real quality reading on, yeah, like how do I prepare myself to get out of a violent relationship and what are some of the steps and what are some of the strategies? I know in my private practice, I advocate for women who may be at risk for things to go left real quickly in their marriage to always have a bag packed, to always have a, a secret uh, suitcase tucked away in the back of the closet that has everything in it that you might need to grab real quick, fast, and in a hurry in the middle of the night. Should you have to run out in the middle of the night, at least you have some basic essentials with you. And of course, if you have children, you have to do the same for them in terms Mm -hmm. of getting some of their basic things together. And then it's just always a good time to connect by Zoom or phone calls or text or whatever you have to do with 
anybody anywhere in your life that was ever a friend to you, that you trusted, and that was ever of support to you, and to begin to share with those that you can share with in the most secretive way possible, um, the reality of the situation in which you find yourself. And so even in the COVID virus era, I think there are people that would be willing to extend a safety net mm -hmm. uh, to when, if you are in fact, you know, in a crisis and uh, have need of a soft and a safe place to land. Yeah. And you kind of spoke to my next question, which states, um, you know, Georgia does rank 10th in the nation for the rate at which women are killed by domestic violence. That is a very, you know, high statistic. Yeah. And so, and, and, and with not, and what are some things that the victims can do? I know, you know, domestic violence is never the victim's fault yeah, uh, right. for any type of violence, but um, you you kind of spoke on that, but what are just some mm -hmm. things that they that, that if you're in that situation or some signs that you know maybe someone can recognize to kind of keep themselves out of a domestic violence situation or some just some things they possibly can do to get out? Well, I think we could bag that up uh, a lot further actually because the way that we care for ourselves mm -hmm. when we are not in a crisis and when we are not in a bad relationship has everything to do with how we care for ourselves when crisis does knock at your door. And so in the seat in which I sit, I am constantly counseling women who simply are not taking care of themselves. They are not connecting with healthy people. They are not exercising. They are not eating well. They're not getting good sleep. And they're operating on an empty tank. And it's only a matter of time before you find yourself in such a vulnerable situation that you begin to attract people into your experience who mean you no good. And because you don't have other outlets and hobbies and interests and good health and good rest and good friends, you put yourself at greater risk to, um, you know, to be vulnerable to whatever that person has to dish out. So anytime you put all your eggs in one basket, you have made yourself vulnerable. And then it's hard to get people out of your heart once you have let them in. That's just the nature and quality of women by and large. And so I would say it starts uh, with how you care for yourself on a day-to-day -day basis and always nurturing good relationships and, and good relations with your neighbor. That's another thing that I, I am amazed at the number of people today that could not even tell you the names of their next door neighbors. Right. You know, they have never exchanged a conversation, never been over to each other's house for dinner or a block party or something. But just that loss of community alone puts puts vulnerable people in in the form of women and children at greater risk. I know in our neighborhood, like we know all our neighbors. Um, we get a dog because a dog will force you to get out of the house and walk and and in the walking on a consistent basis, as Eldwan just touched on, consistency is the key to the breakthrough. You're going to get to know your entire community. You're going to stop and have chit-chat, know their names, their children, your pets, and so right. forth. So that if you ever find yourself in a crisis and friends are not nearby and family is not nearby, oh, well, at least I have a relationship with my neighbor. At least they right. will hear when I scream in the middle of the night. Yes. Well, thank you for that. And then, Mom, one of my next question for you um, has to do with shelter. So in 2018, there were about 2,753 victims and children that made requests for to be in shelters in Georgia. And those requests were not met due to lack of space. So um, if you're someone who needs to get away from a domestic violence situation and, um, you know, you're looking for a shelter, um, how effective, you know, is that, um, you know, being able to get into a shelter, go to a shelter? And do you think we need to expand domestic violence shelters in Georgia? Unfortunately, we do. Um, I know that from my years of working in the prison system, uh, we were always hurting for space for women who were being released or, or discharged from prison who had no home to return to. And if they had children that they needed to gather as well, who were in the custody of the state, it, it was even more problematic. So unfortunately, yes, we, we do need more shelters. And uh, the helpfulness of the shelter will depend on the powers that be at that shelter. Because there are some people that would have more of a, a, a rehab mindset. And you're not just here to go to bed and eat three meals, but we're here actually trying to build you up, trying to bring in some speakers and some classes and some instruction 
on life skills and, uh, you know, the kinds of things that will make you less vulnerable in the future. And then there are others that are just housing you. You know, that's all you're doing is just, just sitting there and you're eating mm-hmm. and one day they're going to release you or one day you'll find other means of, of housing, but you wouldn't have been changed from the inside out. You would not have had your mind renewed. So they're certainly helpful. They're certainly needed. Uh, but again, like anything else in life, it depends on the quality of whoever is at the helm of that organization. Right. And so my last question briefly, you are a life coach. So what are just a few of the benefits that life coaching can help for women who are experiencing domestic violence, but also just for anyone who's going through any type of um, behavioral health issues or crisis? Okay. Well, it's interesting that you asked that question because uh, in my years of being a life coach, where I do a screening on the, on the front end to see if this person is actually a better fit for therapy or a better fit for life coaching, um, I, unfortunately, <laughs> or fortunately, however you choose to look at it, I find that most people are actually in need of therapy um, because life coaching assumes that your life is already in a good place and we're just trying to take it to a better place. And we're trying to do it with a laser focus and you already have the equipping to just sort of, uh, you know, go for what it is you want to enhance in your life. And you need some accountability and somebody cheering you on from the sidelines and dropping some suggestions and planting some seeds. So life coaching probably would not be the best pathway for somebody who finds themselves in a domestic violence situation because there's going to be such wounding there that will need to be healed and uh, a, a new way of, of being and behaving and believing in the world. And uh, you have to look at some of the circumstances that got you into such a vulnerable place in the first place. And that might be depression. It might be anxiety. It might be a history of abuse as a child. It might be PTSD. It might be a number of clinical issues that have hindered your growth and progress. And probably therapy is the better route. Right. And thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. And now that you mentioned that, we're going to segue into our next um, part of this um, program. Um, And you did mention that therapy is the best way to go. And so we're going to now hear from Mr. Mundray Lightford. He is the operations director at the Douglas County Community Services Board. Um, You'll hear a little bit more about that once we play the video in a few minutes. Um, So, uh, Mr. Lightford, thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, the first question I want to ask you is just kind of give us, what are some of the general services that the Douglas County Community Services Board provides? Okay. Well, I'm going to try to be as general as possible with this. Uh, We're like the mall of behavioral health. (laughs) And I'll kind of explain a little bit. Um, So we break down in really three phases, right? So we have our outpatient services, which pretty much focus on psychiatric evaluation and management nursing uh, services, um, Medicaid-assisted treatment, as well as the whole gambit of therapies, whether the individual, family, or directly for substance abuse um, and substance use disorders. I mean, we also have peer support, which is one of our newer programs. Uh, But then our next tier is our community supports program, which is our intensive case management services for individuals who've had long sense of homelessness or are newly released from prison or hospitals. Then routine case management, that's your individual that's having trouble dealing with the day-to-day stressors that all of us have to go through. And then lastly, we have our supported employment program where we actually assign a job coach that goes out and helps you work on job development skills and placement and stays with you throughout until you've had a stable employer for at least a year. Um, and then lastly, we have our residential programs. We have both residential treatment for substance abuse issues, and we also have um, long-term stable supported housing. Um, currently right now, we have about 140 citizens in Douglas County that we actually are the housing uh, authority for. Okay, thank you. And so my next question to you is, um, so what, where does the funding for the Community Services Board comes from? <laughs> Great question again. So uh, our funding is late. Um, we, we get a percentage from the federal government, like our supported housing program we just spoke of. Um, that's through a grant directly through HUD uh, that we use to place individuals who have either a substance abuse or mental health history. Um, Then we also get uh, state funding for some of our specialty services, like our intensive case management. And then we have a very large contribution that we actually get from Douglas County for our core services. Okay. And so if I'm a person in the community and I need help, 
and I need um, and I want to get in contact with the community services board. What uh, what do I do to get in contact with you guys? And is there a fee for me to get your services? Great questions. Uh, so the first part is um, you can walk in any day to our clinic Monday through Friday. Um, our address is fifty nine oh five Stewart Parkway, Douglasville, Georgia three zero one three five. Uh, our operation hours are 7.30 to 5 o'clock, uh, Monday through Friday. Um, for individuals who are either underemployed or do not have employment, our services are absolutely free to those individuals. Um, we also accept most major private insurance companies, and we do have the copay options for individuals who would not want to disclose to their employer or anything else about coming into our services, so they rather pay out of pocket. Um, and so that all pretty much based on exactly what the dynamics are of your financial situation, but we work with individuals. Um, our assessments are at no cost. Um, we bring you into the assessment. We'll, we'll let you know exactly what you're looking at and um, the treatment plan for you. Uh, some services that are specialty services are not offered to everybody. Like, as I mentioned, uh, some of those, uh, those uh, key um, services such as supported employment and intensive case management are only for those underemployed and unemployed individuals because it's afforded to by the state. All right. Thank you for giving us information on the Douglas County Community Service Board. And like I said, we'll see a little bit more about that later. All right. So next, we're just going to go straight into our intervention panel. We will save the questions uh, for after we get through with our next panel. And so we will start with um, a lady that we all know in our community. She represents uh, the vast majority of citizens in Douglas County at the Georgia House uh, of Representatives. Um, she has been very instrumental, and um, she's been very instrumental in working for Douglas County, but also for mental health for children and adults down at the uh, Georgia House of Representatives. So at this time, um, we will ask uh, State Representative Kimberly Alexander to join us um, as a panelist. How are you doing? Thank Good. you. For that. Thank you for the intro. Um, as uh, Tiffany indicated, I'm the state representative for District 66. I have a portion of Paulding County and I also have Douglas County. I want to first thank Tiffany and Commissioner Robinson for putting this together. Uh, you guys have had it for five years and I participated probably on about three of them. So I appreciate you guys for that and, and for the invite. Um, my background, I've been in the House of Representatives now for, this is my fourth term. And um, my background is in audit. I'm not a doctor, but my background is in audit and is in finance and in the operations. And uh, yeah, I have a couple, quite a few bills that I've sponsored in the house. And so I'm just thankful to be here and I appreciate you guys for having me. Thank you. Well, well thank you again so much for being here. I, I go down to the Capitol for Douglas County and I see how hard you work for us every day. So thank you. So next, I will um, invite Dr. Carl Muso, uh, Carlo Muso of CEO Correct Health to come on and just give us a brief brief introduction um, of who he is and um, his background, and we welcome you as a panelist. Good evening, everyone. Um, also, thank you, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, for the invitation. This is my first uh, year to participate in the Mental Health Forum, and I appreciate that. Thanks to you, uh, uh, Tiffany, for reaching out to me uh, this week. Uh, my background, I am an emergency physician. Um, I was trained uh, as uh, and, and worked in several area, uh, uh, metro Atlanta area uh, emergency departments, uh, mostly on the south side of Atlanta. And about 20 years ago, my local sheriff tapped me on the shoulder to, um, to help him uh, manage some of the uh, inmate health care problems he was having at his jail. And over the last 20 years, our company has grown to provide um, uh, health care services to not only Douglas County, but uh, many of the uh, jails uh, in, in Georgia and in the southeast. Um, so um, that, that's my introduction, and we can get into more about what happens in the jail a little bit later. Yes, thank you. And then next, we're going to bring in Morgan Cannon. She is a school psychologist with Douglas County School System. Morgan, welcome, and thank you for being a panelist. We'll now hear your introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm Morgan Cannon. Um, I'm a school psychologist with the um, Douglas County School System. Um, I've been a school psychologist in Douglas County um, since 2012, and I currently serve um, two of our elementary schools and one of our middle schools. Um, so just in a gist, uh, school psychologists typically 
um, spend the majority of our time um, assessing students for um, various categories of special education services. Um, but we also are highly trained in providing um, both individual and group counseling with our students, um, as well as consulting with school staff on um, behavioral interventions, academic interventions, um, we're also a part of um, student support teams um, that tailor uh, interventions to students um, that are struggling academically and behaviorally. Um, so I really love my job and um, I'm really happy to be here. Well, thank you for being here. Um, and next we will, we have two esteemed judges on the panel, uh, Judge Cynthia Adams. She's a Douglas County Superior Court judge. If you will um, do your introduction and welcome to the panel. Well, good evening, everyone. It's really great to be here. This is uh, my third time serving on this uh, on this panel uh, in this forum, and um, I'm excited. And, and thank you again for the invitation. Uh, as Tiffany mentioned, my name is Cynthia Adams. I'm one of your Superior Court judges in Douglas County. Uh, I'm also the presiding judge uh, for our mental health court uh, in Douglas County. Um, again, thank you for having me, and I look forward to, to sharing some information with you guys. All right, thank you. And last but certainly not least, at least we do have our chief juvenile court judge, um, Ms. Michelle Harrison, is here with us. Welcome to the panel. Thank you, and good good evening, everybody. Uh, this is my first time being part of this uh, panel, so I'm very excited to be here tonight. Um, as Tiffany said, I am uh, the judge of our Douglas County Juvenile Court. Um, we do handle various cases that involve the child welfare system, the juvenile justice system, all of which run a gamut with mental health issues, substance abuse issues, um, which we face every time, just about any time a family comes before this court. I have been the uh, chief judge since the beginning of this year. Um, and served as the associate judge, uh, both part-time and full-time since 2006. So thank you for having me. All right, and thank you for being here. So we'll go back to um, Morgan Cannon with the Douglas County School System. Um, and what I do wanna remind all of our panelists to please keep your um, answers succinct and brief. Um, so, you know, we all know, um, especially the work we do in Douglas County that our youth and suicide is a big issue not only in our community, but every community across the country. And um, since 2012, there have been on average 22.8 suicides per 100,000 people in the state of Georgia. And then right on par with the na national average, it's 22.3 suicides per 100,000 people. And then 41 children committed suicide in the state of Georgia in 2018. So, uh, Morgan, I think we can all agree that that is a, a, a big issue, and that's something that no community, and we definitely don't want that in Douglas County. So what are some of the things that Georgians and just Douglas County citizens can do to can reduce that, to help reduce that number? Well, I think one of the most, if not the most important things um, that adults can do um, to reduce this number is to make sure that we all have a really good, solid knowledge base about some of the possible or typical um, suicide warning signs or triggers um, in our youth um, that have been found um, in those people that have been successful in um, taking their own lives. So it's, there, this is obviously not an extensive list, um, but some of the main ones I want to focus on are um, our, our children's tendencies to um, talk about, um, draw mm -hmm. stories about the wishes to harm themselves. Um, you know, saying things like, I just want to die. Um, everyone would be better off without me. So kind of those doom and gloom statements to be looking out for. Um, also be looking out for children that have a plan um, to hurt themselves and that actually have access to the means of executing that plan. So unlocked gun safes are a hazard, um, lack of supervision at home for long periods of time, um, unlocked parental medicine cabinets with prescription pills. Um, so all, th those are all dangers um, that we encounter. Um, another thing to keep a uh, lookout for is students that give away their prized possessions to others unannounced, um, dramatic personality and behavioral changes, um, you know, a happy-go-lucky, vibrant fourth grader that all of a sudden just becomes violent and hostile and aggressive. Um, children can also isolate themselves from others, um, lose um, interest in activities that brought them happiness. 
Um, and also we see a lot of declines in school performance um, and those kids that are highly depressed and suicidal. So I think just keeping that knowledge base in the back of our mind and just really looking out for those triggers and warning signs so we can ultimately get these children the help that they need before you know something that terrible happens. Yeah, and that's that's very important. So mm-hmm. we all know that everybody is, you know, on social media these days, and especially the children and youth in our community. What kind of factor does social media play in um, suicide in our youth? We know there's a lot of online bullying and um, mm-hmm. things of that nature. So what 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 factor is that playing right now in our community? Oh, it's a huge factor. Um, I believe it's one of the most important factors, um, especially for our young women. Um, they tend to be more negatively impacted by the cyberbullying um, that we, our young women also have, you know, the societal pressures of having a certain body type, um, acting in certain ways. Um, and when they don't really fit those molds, then, you know, the cyberbullying starts. And, you know, kids these days are constantly on their phones. They have all kinds of apps that I don't even know the names of all of them. Um, their whole lives are just being broadcasted. Um, and they're under scrutiny, scrutiny constantly. Um, and th- there's also been an uptick in these really dark and gloomy websites and internet rooms that some of them even suggest to young children that they should commit suicide or hurt themselves. Um, and there's just so much graphic and inappropriate content out there on the World Wide Web that we really just have to be mindful of what our children are, you know, seeing on a daily basis. Right. And so you've, you've, you've spoken about some of the things that we can do, but are there any other precautions that not only parents, but aunts, grandparents, neighbors can just kind of take to help children um, who may be in trouble or in danger of committing suicide? Most certainly. Um, I think some of the other panelists um, commented on this, but I think one of the most important things that families can do is to make sure and maintain that connectedness with their children Um, Obviously, COVID-19 has made daily life a struggle for a lot of people, Um, but we just need to make sure that we're checking in with our kids, you know, ask them how they're feeling at school, their friends, their family, Um, and also just be mindful of those risk factors of depression and anxiety um, and suicide also, Um, you know, and just make sure to have that family time with each other and make sure that these kids are staying connected with their schools, their friends, um, and other family members. And I think fostering that openness with your parents is very important. Um, and just teaching children that feelings are meant to be expressed. They're right. suppressed. Um, and also, this goes without saying, but monitor that social media and internet activity. Um, monitor that inappropriate content. Um, get them outside. Um, we all know that exercising and being in nature, you know, increases endorphins and makes people happy. Um, and obviously, if, you know, your child is, having depression, anxiety, suicide, work to get them some outside help. And if financial and money issues, you know, exist, reach out to your school counselors, um, school psychologists, school Mm -hmm. workers, um, and they can connect you guys with all these wonderful community agencies that Douglas County has. Okay. And just a quick, my last question is, um, is there a certain age range that that we really need to hone in on and pay attention on when it comes to our juveniles and our children and youth in our community? Definitely. Um, the most prevalent um, age group, I believe, is the middle and high school students. Mm-hmm. Um, however, more and more um, research and stuff is coming out that you know, five um, have thought about suicide, have tried to commit suicide. Um, one of my first experiences um, with suicide was with a first grade boy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he um, committed suicide. Um, so while our middle and high school teenager kids, we got to really keep our eye on it's it's trickling down into the younger kids as well. Well, thank you, Morgan, for all those yeah. pre- things we can do to prevent and help our youth in Douglas County. So next we'll move on to Representative Kimberly Alexander um, for the question portion. And so as I mentioned earlier, Representative Alexander has been a big part of um, fighting for mental health and behavioral health in our children in Douglas County, but also for all Georgia citizens. So one of the questions that I have, um, could you tell us a little bit about any of the uh, initiatives or legislation that you've been a part of to help with behavioral health issues? So I first started uh, in 2016, and I wrote a a study committee bill. It was H.R. 1093, 
And this was a study committee bill that looked at the initiatives, the reforms, public health and safety concerning the mental health. And that passed out of the House in 2016, and I chaired that um, study committee. And out of the study committee came about nine recommendations. The first recommendation was to create a commission on children's mental health. In 2017, Governor Dale created the Children's Mental Health Commission. As a result, the 2019 budget included a great deal of the items that came out of the Children's Mental Health Commission. And then in 2018, I also sponsored House Bill 659, which was a bill on medical, technical, and paramedics to observe and involuntary conduct evaluation and treatment of mental illness. And also in 2018, I sponsored House Bill 733, which is, was a bill to add more psychiatrists to current loan repayment and fellowship programs. As a result of that bill, what happened is that I had to have a lot of meetings with uh, the Director of Community Workforce Development, Chairwoman of the Health and Human Services, and the Chairman of the Health Appropriations. As a result, the FY19 budget also included a line item of $1.9 million for medical doctors in the rural areas to include psychiatrists, since we have limited psychiatrists in the rural areas. Also in 2019, a bill that actually came from under the Douglas delegation was House Bill 441, and that was to create a treatment program within the juvenile court relating to the prevention and treatment of substance abuse. Thank you, and that, that's a very extensive list of legislation and initiatives. So are there any, is there any legislation that we should be aware of that's pending right now um, during the 2019-2020 legislative session that pertains to mental health or behavioral health? So that's quite a few. So I, I, I'll try to read off just a few of these. Um, we passed one that was HB 514, and this was to create a Georgia Behavior Health Reform and in Innovation Commission, similar to what we did with the criminal justice. So they had their first meeting in December 18, 2019. But that's what that uh, commission is, is to try to create some great legislation on mental illness similar to the criminal justice reform and what we did with that. During the 2020 session, there's there's quite a lot of bills, so I won't read off all of them, but oh. I read off some of them. HB 760 was to um, relate to examination and treatment for mental illness. It authorizes peace officers to take a person to a physician or emergency receiving facility. And then there were quite a few bills on veteran suicide prevention and um, there was one bill that was passed, and that was HB 842, and it prohibits providers and health insurers from discriminating against potential organ transplant recipients mm -hmm. due solely to the physical or mental disability of the potential recipient. So that did pass out of the House. Right. Well, that, that's good that they're, you know, that you guys are thinking about the citizens and their behavioral health issues. Yes. So is there anything that the current budget may have in store for mental health concentrated programs? So what I did was is I looked at the, judge, the Georgia Budget Policy Institute and I also um, looked at the Georgia Department of Behavior Health over a five-year span just to see what the increase decrease was as it relates to the budget. So I did it from 2016 to 2020, and it has increased. Um, it was more of an increase in 2016 at 4.53%. When you look at the whole state budget and what is appropriated for um, behavior, health, and development disabilities, and in 2017, it was 4.35% of the state budget. Okay. And then in 2018, it was 4.39%. In 2019, it was 4.41%. In 2020, it was 4.47%. So it has increased Good. throughout the years. Well, that's great. And we do know that the COVID-19 epidemic is going on right now. We're hearing a lot of, about local governments and state governments having, um, you know, a budget issues and, and, and the re loss of revenue. Um, do you think that what's going on may have an impact on funding for mental health programs and assistance in the F-121 budget? So the COVID-19 pandemic has placed an economic impact to Georgia's budget. We have less sales tax and revenue that is being collected 
ever since this occurred. Uh, and so the appropriation committee started having their hearings on last week. Mm -hmm. And the estimations is that the state is about four billion in the hole for the upcoming year. Uh, with about 2.7 million in savings, that is the rainy day fund that we have for the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. So currently, each state agency is required to cut their budget by 14%. So we're due back on June the 11th to convene and take a vote on the FY budget. So we'll know a little bit more about what that looks like once we get back in session and have that vote. Well, thank you so much. And I know when you go back on June 11, you'll be fighting for mental health yeah. and all the citizens <laughs> in Douglas County and Georgia. And we appreciate everything that you do. So thank you so much for being a panelist with us today. Thank you. All right. So next we will move on to uh, Dr. Carlo Musso, the CEO of Correct Health. And his focus will be on our um, citizens who are incarcerated in our local jails who may have some mental health issues. And so, uh, Dr. Miso, are you here and ready to begin your questions? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So, Dr. Okay. Miso, uh, thank you again for being here. So, we know that about 83% of our jail inmates with mental illness do not have access to mental health services and support. So, that's a statistic that's widely known. Um, in a mental health crisis, people are more than likely to encounter a police and get medical attention. I think um, the LA County Jail is supposedly the biggest mental health facility in the country. So what are the services that are available for those who are in need of mental, mental health um, treatment if they are in jail? Um, a good question. Um, uh, to give it uh, some uh, context, let's talk about uh, mental health in general and then how it it, uh, uh, and, and how the numbers are skewed in, in the incarcerated population. In general, um, in my practice of emergency medicine prior to working in, uh, in corrections, um, mental health comprised of about 10 to 15 percent of uh, my caseload in, in a typical emergency department, whether it's Brady or Douglas General or, or, or whatnot. Um, and in an incarcerated individual, it's uh, well above 30, almost 40%. So you see how in, in correctional environment compared to, say, retail health care or health care available in the, pump, in the public, the numbers are skewed. Suicide is between number 10 and 11 as a cause of death to all Americans. But yet in a jail... Suicide is the number one cause of death, mm -hmm. comprising of over oh, uh, over 30 percent of mortality in jails and prisons and, uh, uh, nationwide. So you can see that not only is our caseload higher in our incarcerated individuals, but the acuity is also higher. And in particular, uh, uh, issues re revolving around suicidality. Um, why that is, uh, is, 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 is in part access to care and the closure of many of our um, state institutions that formerly housed uh, the, the mental health patients, in part, as well as other contributing factors. And I, I won't get into that. We don't have time for it. Okay. But <clears throat> what are the services available uh, currently in the Douglas County Jail? Uh, I think if we, uh, if I walk you through how um, uh, someone um, it, it is arrested and gets a uh, um, uh, booked into the facility, uh, it'll share, shed some light. But individuals who are under arrest will arrive at the jail uh, to uh, uh, to be booked in, uh, no matter what their problem is. Uh, they're immediately triaged in our um, in our intake uh, booking area, which is to say, a nurse assesses them um, and um, and screens them. Um, they are getting vital signs, they're getting questions regarding their health care, their mental health care, have they had attempted suicide before, or, or, in the, or are they under the care of any uh, mental health professional in the community, in particular, are they taking any mental health medications? And depending on the uh, answers to those uh, questions, um, they are then referred uh, to our mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. We have psychiatrists uh, available to the facility as well as counselors and social workers. 
Um, and the, that list, of, that triage list is then referred and generates our, our, our schedule just like you would in any clinic uh, situation. So okay. on average, we, we run about 40 to 50 patients per week uh, in, our, in our counseling and about a dozen or so patients that are seen by our psychiatrists that are uh, severely mentally ill and medicated. Okay. So that's kind of roughly uh, how the system works and, and, and the size and scope of our, of our problem. And in addition to those patients being seen, we, we house them in some mental health observation if they're severely mentally ill. And also there's a very um, active suicide prevention program that we, uh, we manage patients who have expressed a uh, desire to hurt themselves and have attempted uh, to hurt themselves in the past. So our, um, we, we have a watch called Suicide Watch in our facility where we make frequent rounds and 15 minute checks um, on those individuals to make sure they're, they're doing well. Okay, thank you. And so um, you answered my question about um, is there testing in jail? So that is something that looks like you do, you do the screening. Um, what, what constitutes if someone comes in and they are they they have psychiatric issues. What constitutes them? Is, or is there a way that they could be moved to a psychiatric institution if they need that help? Um, we in certain circumstances. Well, first of all, we're providing the care uh, there. We do have a psychiatrist and and medical doctors who uh, provide the care. Um, to, uh, uh, and I didn't mention substance abuse earlier. I should have mentioned substance abuse. So. If our caseload is about 30% on the mental health side, there's another 30% uh, uh, or 40% of individuals who have substance abuse problems, which uh, is a mental health uh, uh, issue as well, at least in my opinion. And there's a lot of comorbidities or overlap in that, in that group uh, uh, as well. So uh, they are also uh, um, uh, treated. They're, you know, they're, they undergo various withdrawal protocols to make sure that they don't get sick or hurt. Um, or uh, as a result of, uh, of their withdrawal from their uh, alcohol or, or, or drug. And, um, and then once they're over that uh, withdrawal period, they're, they're immediately referred to our mental health professionals for, for counseling. And in addition to that, the uh, Sheriff's Office provides a, a myriad of 12 step program and other group uh, uh, therapy available to those individuals. Okay. Uh, um, so, 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 so that, is it ideal to provide care in 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 the in, inside in the jail facility? I wouldn't say it's ideal, but it is. Uh, you know, uh, you know, our goal is to to assess and stabilize these individuals and 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 to treat when when indicated uh, in as much as it is possible. We do refer some to the state hospital. Um, ones that are court ordered for forensic mental health evaluation are automatically sent there for evaluation. And those, uh, those um, um, individuals who are very challenged to manage in, in the jail facility, uh, we, we, we attempt to transfer uh, to, to a Georgia regional. Okay. I tell you, those beds are becoming more and more difficult to, to find. Um, and, 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 uh, and right now, there's very little referrals due to the COVID pandemic, uh, only because we're trying to protect um, the, the, the patients at Georgia Regional from our inmates and vice versa. So we're trying to minimize movement between um, mental health uh, institutions and correctional institutions, uh, because we, that has contributed to the spread of COVID. Um, and so we're, we're actually... <laughs> We're actually taking care of, uh, we're even more aggressive than normal uh, with regard to forced medications and other things that we would not typically do in a, in a jail situation. Okay. So the, so the mental health patients and the COVID patients, they're being kept separate from the general population. If you have a mental health issue or, for example, let's just say even if you had a health issue like COVID-19, they're being kept separate from oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And, uh, and if anybody knows, the jail is a fairly new uh, building and was... Uh, was specifically um, um, constructed with, I guess, a pandemic, a future pandemic in mind, because they have, we 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 have the luxury in Douglas County to have a good space to quarantine and, and sequester individuals who are suspected or confirmed to be COVID positive, and other medical problems as well. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Miso. I really appreciate you giving us that insight onto what's going on in our um, local jails with our with our, our citizens who are most vulnerable, who have mental health and substance abuse issues. Thank you. So next we will move on to someone who knows a lot about um, dealing with citizens who have substance abuse and mental health issues. She is our um, Douglas County Superior Court Judge, Cynthia Adams. She is over our DUI and Drug Mental Health Court in um, for the Superior Court. And we're very lucky to have her here. So Judge Adams, um, will you join us as a panelist now? Well, thank you again, uh, Tiffany, for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to serve on uh, this panel and to be able to provide information to the community about what's going on in our great county. Thank you. So we've heard a lot about the accountability court um, and so if you could just give us a brief idea, what is an accountability court? What, what, right. what does an accountability court do? So uh, I'll give you a brief summary. Uh, in about 2012, the Georgia legislator uh, created these courts. Uh, and when we talk about uh, uh, accountability courts, what we're talking about are basically courts that are set up as a means of alternative sentencing uh, for nonviolent offenders. Um, the goals of these, uh, of these courts are to reduce the prison population uh, and also to reduce recidivism. Uh, and so specifically, uh, I will talk about uh, mental health court, which I'm the presiding judge of mental health court, and we are a dual diagnosis court, meaning a lot of our participants deal with both, both substance abuse issues as well as mental health issues. But as far as accountability courts go, you have of uh, various kinds of courts. You have veterans courts, drug courts are probably the most popular that people have heard about or know, uh, know about. Uh, but you also uh, have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, veterans courts, you have the drug courts, you have the mental health courts, um, and then you have family treatment courts. And they all fall under the umbrella of these accountability courts. We even have the parental accountability courts now uh, that have joined in. Um, and so we have various courts. So that kind of gives you a rough idea of what these courts are. Okay. And so for someone who's never, you know, some, a lot of people have never even been to court, but um, you've kind of given us an idea, but what does the process look like? I know I've, I'm a former prosecutor, former defense attorney, but for the average person who doesn't know, what, what does that process look like? If I come into court, I, you know, I've been caught with um, drugs, I'm not distributing them, but it's obvious that I'm using it. What, what does that process look like for the average citizen? All right, so uh, so let me first of all uh, uh, explain that right now we uh, we have our drug court uh, in Douglas County. We also have the mental health court, uh, as I mentioned. Um, we try to get these cases as early as possible, uh, which I think is most important in being successful. So what we will try to do is we will try to identify individuals as they are arrested. Uh, meaning when they end up in magistrate court the first time that they have their first court appearance, um, certain individuals are, are appointed or, or, uh, or recognized as possibly having some sort of mental health diagnosis. Um, in those early phases, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that we have a good working relationship with the jail as well. Uh, and so we are in communication with our partners at the jail, Communications with those uh, in communication with those at the, uh, on the magistrate court level, uh, who will normally see these individuals first, um, and we're able to recognize these individuals. Um, and so, what happens uh, most times when people are in that initial phase, um, they may not have an attorney. Uh, we have uh, an attorney from the public defender's office who is on our staff, on our team, uh, and um, and helps in recognizing those individuals as well as they come in. We also have um, uh, individuals from the DA's office. We have individuals from the sheriff's office that are on our team. Um, so we have a team of folks, clinicians, that are working together to identify individuals immediately as they become involved in the process. And so what happens from then on, and, and, and let me uh, not forget to add that we also have families. Of course, families are... Uh, have the most information about uh, their family members who have been diagnosed or have been dealing with mental illness. Um, and so we have these team of folks that will help us recognize and help us help give information, provide information about these individuals. So then we can 
know how to deal um, with those individuals if we are going to consider them for participation in the court. So as you mentioned, let's say you know you you don't know you're in court, uh, you don't know how uh, how this works. Um, with those individuals that I've I've pointed out to you, um, you yourself may not know how it works. But if you are displaying symptoms um, or if someone recognizes that you are someone that would benefit from either the drug court program or the mental health court program, which we call our HOPE court uh, program, then there is someone that will be able to put you in touch with the right person to get the paperwork done so that you can get recommended as a participant in the program. Okay. And so my last question is, how do you how do you segment this? Is this by uh, demographics? Is it by uh, prognosis? Is there do you segment the population in your uh, mental health program? So our program is open and available to anyone who is involved in our court system um, who we feel has a mental health diagnosis. Uh, we've even extended it and, and we're proud, um, uh, you know, to to say and to acknowledge. And I think that. Um, in Douglas County, we're probably ahead um, of the curve here and ahead of the game in terms of um, for those who uh, the jail may point out to us that they might be suffering from some mental health issue uh, that may have gone undiagnosed. Uh, we have put steps into place in terms of how we can reach those individuals and possibly bring those persons into the program. Uh, we know that it's an issue. Uh, that uh, that society is dealing with, that our community uh, is dealing with, that the jail is dealing with. And so our goal is to try to alleviate the pressures that are being felt by families, that are being felt by the jail um, in general, and that's being felt by the community so that we can provide a service to these individuals. Because Tiffany, what happens is once these individuals uh, end up participating in the program, even if they don't complete the program, uh, we find that statistics have shown that someone who's, who's been touched by one of these programs will either end up turning their lives around or certainly there will be some change in them that will cause them to be less likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. And so these programs are doing some, some serious good in our community and, and in our state. Yes, they definitely are. Yes, we. I think we've been able to witness and also witness some of the um, cost effectiveness that they've had for local municipalities. Thank you, Judge Adams. And thank next, you. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to our um, last panelist, Judge Harrison. She is our one of our, our newest, well, she's been a judge, but she's now the chief judge for our juvenile courts in Douglas County. And she's doing an amazing job, as she always has. Uh, Judge Harrison, welcome as a panelist. Thank you. Glad to be here. Always good to be right at the end so that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can bring up everybody. You can bring it on home. <laughs> so in 2018, um, there are about 827 youth who were housed in secure detention centers in Georgia. Um, and there are about 232 youth serving time in adult jails. What can we as community members do to kind of help lower those numbers? What are some of the things that we just the average community could do who deal with youth, who may have youth or juveniles in their families? What can we do to help with that? So first of all, that, that number is obviously a statewide number um, right. and not applicable just to Douglas County. Um, in fact, Douglas County is, you know, probably one of the less uh, numbers that are applicable to that number. Um, but one thing that we do see with our youth that are in long-term detention um, are similar to what has already been described by everyone else. We have mental health issues um, even before they get into um, the detention facilities. They're facing substance abuse issues. We have a lot of self-medication. Um, and a lot of those issues go back to the root of the family, the parents being able to understand uh, what mental health looks like, um, that, you know, obviously it is not something you can see and touch, but it's something within, um, and to recognize those issues early on with our youth who are at risk so that they can seek out 
services that are available in the community. So in some respects, one of the best ways to reduce that number um, of youth being either detained in a detention facility or in the adult system is to really educate our parents and our families to recognize the, the cues uh, before they get to the point where youth are getting in trouble. Yeah, and that's very important. And I think I, the numbers show that like 80% of these youth are male, and that's a that's a big statistic. Um, do you think that it has to do with a lack of positive programming and role models? So one of the things that I can say that I consistently see in court is that most of our youth, whether it's male or female, generally come from single-parent homes. Um, and generally speaking, uh, that's the mother that is, you know, raising our youth. Um, and it is very difficult for the positive male role model. Um, that's why it's so important for our kids to make connections with teachers, um, the school resource officers, uh, administration in the schools to reach out for those positive uh, role models, because if you're not getting it at home, you've got to get it somewhere. Um, we do have some terrific organizations in our county that do provide services, but then in conjunction with that, they end up actually, these leaders and teachers end up becoming role models and mentors for our youth. Um, and we can never really have not, a, we could really always use mental um, uh, role models, positive male role models for our males and for, for our females. You know, the number um, that you provided of the 80% the being youth, you know, typically what we see are a lot of females that are getting involved in sex trafficking. So they may not be the ones that are getting locked up, but we have a high number of females that are getting involved in a situation where they also need positive um, role models and mental health treatment, substance abuse treatment. So, um, yeah, those numbers are, are, are astronomical, and we definitely need to pay attention to those numbers so that we can lower them and even the playing field, so to speak. That's, uh, that's a very high. Thank you. And so my last question is, I, and one of the things that a lot of people who deal in the criminal justice system knows that Georgia is actually a leader when it comes to um, accountability courts and also in juvenile justice. Um, former Governor Nathan Dill put about $20 million in the budget for juvenile reform, which includes mental health services. And we thank our legislators like Kimberly Alexander, who helped to support those, um, those initiatives. Are there any additional services that... Um, our leadership should provide in order to combat the number of delinquent crimes or juvenile youth that you can think of? So I will just put a plug in for the, the criminal justice reform as it applies to juvenile. We are one of the incentive grant uh, recipients, Douglas County is, and we have a fantastic program run through juvenile court that does address um, our, our high risk youth. Um, as an alternative to long-term um, confinement or, or placement in a detention facility. We also um, have a wonderful connection with our community service board in terms of providing us with services for our parents and our youth. Um, one area that is sort of overshadowed um, by making sure that we're taking care of the, the higher-end kids is our low-risk kids or our at-risk children. And that is where we need to front load um, our access to infiltrating the families because those are the children that are starting down the wrong way. And if we can get to them and their families um, at, at the initial onset of going down the wrong road and provide those services, we can avoid the long-term um, deep end detention placements for, for our youth. Um, we, there are no real state incentives um, grant funding that apply directly to that, that at-risk population. Um, and so that is something that we really need to look forward to, to try to uh, gain out here and throughout the state. Um, but I will say just as a short little plug, um, there is an excellent resource guide that has um, been created by our Juvenile Programs Administration Department that is on the Douglas County website 
um, under programs, under CORE, um, and it has a plethora of up-to-date information for all sorts of resources that are available to our families and youth. Um, we try to disseminate that uh, resource guide to everyone that touches law enforcement, touches the court at the initial onset so that families can actually try to reach out and get services without getting court involved. Well, thank you so much. And that is a very good um, resource guide and you can find it at CelebrateDouglasCounty.com. So at this time, we will bring back in um, Commissioner Kelly Robinson, and he's going to uh, provide some um, just some words to close everything out. And then we will, with the help of my communications department, try to show the video for those who want to uh, remain on and see the video. So um, I think we should commend Commissioner Robinson for all of his great work and putting together such an amazing panel and his um, legislative aide, Mr. Ruben Tillman, I think they did an amazing job. So at this time, I will turn it over to uh, Douglas County Vice Chairman Kelly Robinson. Thank you, Madam Director. Uh, again, hello, everybody. So I'm going to be quick, but but first I want to thank my, this, this panel. This was good. This was some very good information, and I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased as the outcome. I think we accomplished all that we did. So for the sake of time, because you guys know me, I like to start and end on time. I'm just going to run through my thank yous. By, you know, I know Dr. Adjuan Tark had to drop off, so I want to thank him for his emphasis on time. Um, he was one of our original panelists, so I'm, I'm so grateful for his contribution and his willingness just to respond to a phone call and say, I'll be there whatever you need, Commissioner Robinson. Next, Dr. Pamela Thompson. Thank you, madam. You've been so kind, and you were one of my original panelists as well, but there was something that you didn't, it didn't come up this time, but I remember the last time you spoke, you said this to me. You said this to the panel. Everybody is not evil, right? So th that means that there's something out there w within every individual that just because something is off and it may not be the normal behavior that we expect, everything is not evil. So if there was something, one or two things that you want to give as a takeaway, just give us one or two things uh, that you think is important for the citizens to know. Would you mind? Uh, I just uh, think you know, we could all be more gracious toward one another and we could all be less judgmental because life is hard enough as it is and we all are struggling with something in some shape, form, or fashion. We're all flawed. And so whereas we might, we might not all be operating from a place of darkness and evil, we certainly are all flawed and we all need each other. And I think the COVID uh, crisis has certainly uh, heightened our understanding of how much we need each other and how, how important it is for us to keep our communities intact. Absolutely. Thank you. And again, I appreciate it. Again, back to the loneliness. And of course, everybody is not on the Enoch Elijah Express out of here. So no doubt about it, we need to be a little bit more gracious and humble. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Next, um, Dr. Cannon. Thank you so much to you, um, Dr. Trent North and the entire school board. We appreciate your contribution to our day's um, 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 panel discussion. And I just want to close with, is there anything you want to share? I mean, again, I appreciate you highlighting the, the young five-year-olds and the first grader and that, that sort of sentiment. But also, can you give us some, some insight about, and again, I'm coming back to this, the maturity of the middle school, the grownness, the, the, the social media. I mean, what, what can be a takeaway? Like, gosh, that is a serious thing. They're way more grown than I was when I was at that age. And so, Doctor, can you just give us some insight as to one or two things you'd like to take away for the general public? Thank you, Madam. Um, you're you're very right with that. Um, our kids are getting older and older, older and older. They're behaving older and older. They're getting exposed to more mature um, information on a daily basis. Um, so I think just <laughs> we need to just focus on letting kids be kids um, and let them, you know, enjoy um, all that adolescence and, you know, high school has to offer. Um, and I think our kids these days are under tremendous amounts of pressure and stress. Um, and certainly with this COVID-19 is a newfound stress that none of us were really prepared for and have experienced. Um, I forgot which panelist said it, but just giving each other grace um, and just, you know, just trying to just make it day by day during, you know, these really hard times is just going to be crucial. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And Stephanie, yeah. again, keep up the good work. And um, sometimes you're, you know, unsung heroes within school systems, which is so big, one of our largest employers, but I know what you do and I appreciate you. Thank you for being Thank here. You. All right. Dr. Monre, I mean, Director Lightford. You know you're a man after my own heart. I appreciate all that you do for the Community Service Board. Is there any takeaway you want to give for resources-wise? 
Absolutely. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, you can. You're fine. I just want to share something. One of our one of our greatest treasures is being a natural support to someone, which means we're that confidant or we're that family member that they depend on in times of need. And so what I want to just give is a couple of little key bullet points to understand when somebody reaches out to you when they're going through some type of distress. You know, one, set time aside without distraction so you can really understand the message is being given to you. Um, let them share as much as they want to or as little as they want to. Don't try to pry and dig anything out. And whatever you do, don't try to diagnose them or second guess their own feelings about what's going on. Um, and oftentimes when we do this, listen carefully to what they're saying. Try to figure out the emotion behind what's going on. And also just very, very quickly, know your own limits. If you feel that a person is in a, in a high risk situation or more likely to harm themselves or others, you know, reach out for help. You know, a Georgia crisis line is a great number for us. It's 1-800-715-4225. I'll say that again. They're 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you really want to be a support, volunteer to go along with them to their first appointment if they're seeking help. Um, and that's all I have to add. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, um, Director Leifert. Making the turn to the interventionist. Thank you so much, Madam State Rep. Kenley Alexander. Obviously, I, 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 I intentionally delayed my commentary about your contributions to mental health because I didn't want to take any thunder from all that you did. But um, you are an ally for us. You're rock solid. You don't move. You don't bend. And we appreciate what you do at the state level, for, both with CSB and with what we do locally as it relates to ordinances. So your, your insight, your access to resources, um, again, you're, you're, it's priceless. Thank you, Madam Rep. Is there anything that you would like to share in closing comments? So according to the Mental Health America of Georgia, there are more than 2 million Georgians living with mental illness. Georgia ranks 47th when it comes to access to mental health care resources and insurance. A recent poll by KFF Health Tracking Poll found that nearly half of U.S. adults say that the coronavirus has negatively affected their mental health. Those numbers are probably going to rise. We don't know that right now until maybe about four to six months down the line, but we see it with the domestic violence, some suicide. So I would encourage people, and I know the number was given out before, but I want to give it out again. The Georgia Crisis Access Line, 24 hours, seven days a week, 800-715-4225. Please reach out if you need to. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. And you bring up a good point. Again, um, they say that money and power amplifies within what's inside of a person. Uh, fear does as well. And we're going through unprecedented times. And, and you're right. Um, and you bring up this whole point of where we are right now and everything that's going on out there. So I, I think the, the resources you just provided, that number, we'll make sure we make that available at the end of the at the program. But it's so key. So thank you for your insight and, and again, your leadership at our state delegation. I'm going to keep moving. Dr. Musso, thank you so much. Again, your first time on our panelists. Um, people are always asking all our, uh, all of us on the commissioners, well, what are we doing in the jail? You know, the jail is one of those constitutional officers' worlds. Um, obviously, we've got Sheriff um, um, Tim Pounds, who's responsible for that, and we rarely have insight. But there's always one note, are they being cared for? So any takeaway that you want to give to the citizens for something that obviously we know what the jail is, we know what it's there for, but what insight can you give assurances-wise that they're being taken care of? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Robinson. Um, I, I, I can assure that um, our, our, our inmate patients are being cared for uh, at the jail. Uh, we have a, a robust staff of about uh, 20 or so individuals who provide care uh, on a daily and weekly basis. Um, uh, it's a difficult uh, um, a group to manage, um, as, you, as most could uh, imagine, but I would like to acknowledge uh, Judge Adams and, and, and her efforts on, at the accountability courts. Uh, I, I, can, I can say uh, point blank that we have felt um, uh, the relief that the accountability courts have uh, given us at the jail. So uh, that, that, those accountability courts are, uh, are, are making an impact and, and helping us at the jail. And also, uh, Director Lightford, um, um, it's, it's nice to have met him uh, in this uh, forum for the first time because when when our, our our inmate patients are not incarcerated, they're oftentimes getting care at, at his CSB. So nice to meet you, um, uh, Director Lightford, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll have the pleasure to meet uh, 
after this pandemic is over and, and talk about how we can play pitch and catch between the jail and the, and the CSB. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Russo. And, and a perfect segue, uh, Judge Atlas. Welcome. Obviously, yes, you have been involved, but you took over uh, the mental health as a presiding judge on uh, last fall. So any closing comments? I've been waiting on this to hear from you. Uh, what would you like to say? Go right ahead. Commissioner, again, thank you. It's always a pleasure to serve on this panel. You know, historically, the courts have not been seen or looked at as a place of refuge uh, for individuals who are involved in uh, the criminal justice system. Normally, if you are making your way to, to the courts, um, it's for something that, uh, that doesn't necessarily put a smile on your face. Um, what I'd like to leave with the community is um, I'd like them to know that uh, at the Douglas County Courthouse, um, that you have people who are working on your behalf, who sincerely are interested in helping you and your family members who come uh, into those doors, who are involved in the criminal justice system, who are involved in the court system. Uh, I want you to know that people um, are working hard uh, to stop that revolving door of recidivism, that people are committed to trying to help individuals who become involved or entangled in our system to help them to find jobs, to help them reunite with their families, and we are interested in helping them become pro productive members of our community, because this is our community. We live here, we work here, and we want it to be the best community possible. Um, and you truly have people who from the bench all the way on down, who are working um, for the benefit of, of those who, come, who, be, who become uh, involved in, in, in our system. Um, so if there's anything, any takeaway that anyone can take from that, um, I hope you understand that and I hope you use the resources that are available um, out there. And thanks again for having me. Thank you, Judge Andrews. And, and finally, um, uh, Judge Harrison, we welcome you again. I wanna acknowledge your appointment now as our chief juvenile judge. Anything you want to close out for us? Uh, well, first, I would just want to say, Commissioner Robinson, thank you for including me in this forum. Um, you know, unfortunately, our youth is where the, the issues begin. Um, but the main thing that I want to send out to the community is we really have to be vigilant to watch out for each other, um, to infiltrate our families, to recognize that youth get court involved, um, from from the lack of oversight and supervision uh, by our, our families. And it just gets further down the road if we don't address the at-risk youth um, from the onset to avoid those long-term effects of our youth being in the system. So thank you for this opportunity. Again, this has been a five-year journey. It's important to acknowledge that Douglas County, in light of the pandemic, this is our 150th year of, um, of celebration of our birthday. We were founded you know, 150 years ago. So think about it. We're on deck right now. So these contributing um, panelists, you guys are helping shape the next 150 years. Uh, it's something that was important to be marked. Um, it's just not enough to talk about having mental health, but to let's do something about it to maintain it and address the mental illness that are going on. Again, we can talk about health, we can talk about you know, our physical health and our financial health and our spiritual health, but our mental health is something that, you know, we're still, we're trying to stop the stigma. We're beginning to make the change. We're beginning to acknowledge, but again, it's something that is going to require um, a long-term haul. So with that being said, Direct, um, Director Tiffany Stewart Stanley, please come back in. We're going to close this out and run our video. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us in this fifth annual um, uh, mental health forum. Thank you and good night. Tiffany? All right. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. And I just want to say once again, thank you for having this forum. And I want to make sure that everybody knows that this mental health and behavioral health for um, Commissioner Robinson, it's a passion. One of the first conversations I had working with him at the Board of Commissioners is about using my, my work in public engagement to really help the citizens in Douglas County who are facing those issues. So he has brought me in and made me passionate about behavioral health and mental health and He's planted the seed that Douglas County is used to expand and actually become one of the, um, I think, one of the shining examples in the state, but also in the country 
for a community that cares about their citizens and who really wants to make sure that everybody's working collaborative, collaboratively and working together. So that cannot be understated, the importance of having an advocate for people in the community who are vulnerable. So I want to thank everyone who was on the panel, and not just Commissioner Robinson, but all of our commissioners, because every last one of them worked very hard and they care about our citizens. So I'm going to attempt to show the video again, but if not, Rick Martin, our communication director, has me backed up. So we're going to try it. Thank you so much for being here. And if all of the panelists could please mute their um, their their videos, I mean, their things as we run the video. So we're going to try to share it again. So. Is it not playing? Is it? It's not playing. Okay, Rick, can you try to play it then? I apologize. We played this 10 times earlier today and it came right through. Rick, you're going to have to go back and, sh and when you started playing, push um, the button that says share your audio. Is it playing?
County is a diverse, vibrant suburban community of approximately 150,000 people. It's a collaborative community that enjoys coming together to work, live, and play. But just like every community in America, it faces its share of behavioral health issues. Elected officials play a major role in the fight against behavioral health issues in the community. Douglas County Commissioner Kelly Robinson has been one of the community leaders leading the charge against behavioral health issues in the Douglas County community. Remember, the Board of Commissioners is a, a unique function. Think about Congress, think about the General Assembly. Uh, we're legislators, we're not the day-to-day, -day, right? So anything dealing with um, um, public safety, anything dealing with hospitals, anything about delivery of services is handled by the executive branch. So as a Board of Commissioner, our job primarily is to appropriate get behind and sponsor those things that we think the community needs. If there's something within the executive branch that we think that needs to be added to, we do that. So I wanted to really understand how um, the judicial worked, how um, citizens may have wound up in sort of our penal system. And I remember the chief judge uh, responded to the questions like, okay, so I mean, why, are, why are people get 20 years to life? What was happening with that? Ms. Robinson, very simply, we didn't have alternative sentencing options. Why are we putting people inside the penal system versus inside an institutional hospital? And what we recognize at the state level is that they were not no longer building what? Hospitals. Right? So so if you don't have hospitals that could or institutions that could, you know, care for these people in the proper way, and all you had was one institution would put one size fits all, that became um, a fundamental issue for our society, and primarily within the county. And so thus one of the drags that we typically had is that we have people who are incarcerated for no reason. They need medical treatment. They need mental treatment, not not that type of treatment. So for me, it, it, was, it, was, it was important to sort of highlight that there is a difference. There's segments of the population within the penal system that can be addressed differently at a more affordable way. And I had this one workshop that talked about mental health, right? And I said, oh, that would be a good class to take. So I'm in this class with about, probably about 300 of us just sitting around, you know, continuing learning. And um, I remember the, the guest speaker from the state, and she was making the comments about how um, these new accountability courts are coming out. Um, they were coming out of Hall County. Um, there were um, what I want to call, it, it was um, everything dealing with you know, perhaps veterans and DUI and drug and mental. And there was these prongs. And, and I'm listening intently, like, okay, here's some alternative sending options. Okay. And somewhere along the way, the lady says, well, basically, it, it became, we can't afford to have people in jail for 30 years, and they come out, and we still have to take care of them. And it was one of those, like, did y'all hear what she just said? And it was more, it wasn't a moral issue, it was more of, a, a, of an economic issue. In other words, if you put people in a box, you don't really treat them well, they're in there for perhaps for life, 30 years, they get out, and then you, you found yourself in a situation where the state... Um, the local municipalities were still trying to care for them at a burden that, okay, how did that policy work out? So what you saw was from, um, I saw a statistic that showed from 1985 to 2015 of how people were incarcerated. And they watched that 30-year policy run. They realized that, oh, God, economically, we cannot sustain this rate. The Douglas County court system is instrumental in helping members of the Douglas County community with behavioral health issues. Let's learn more about some of the programs and services they provide. I preside over the mental health court program here, which we refer to uh, as HOPE Court. And HOPE is an acronym for helping our participants in the cycle. Uh, we hope to help our participants in the cycle of not recognizing or not acknowledging that they have a mental or suffer from a mental health illness. Uh, because there is so much stigma um, involved with having a mental health or dealing with mental health issues um, and also helping them in the cycle of uh, not taking their medication properly, uh, handing, helping them in the cycle of coming in and out of the, the criminal justice system because of uh, issues that they might be suffering from, that they're self-medicating. Behavioral health issues are rampant in our community. But Douglas County's not alone in that problem. Every year we incarcerate almost 2 million people in this country that have a serious mental illness. Largely those mental illnesses go 
undertreated while they're in custody, and people decompensate and destabilize while they're in custody. We have done things basically the same way in this country for about 200 years. We are very good at locking people up. We are not very good at solving problems. The accountability courts are a new way that we can approach behavioral health issues, and the Hope Court program is one of those initiatives. So the Hope Court is a life-saving courtroom. It's staffed by criminal justice professionals uh, that are specially trained in behavioral health and addiction. Uh, so it's the first time that a participant might walk into a room and everyone in that room's sole purpose is to see their life get better. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary team. There are judges, there are prosecutors, there are defense attorneys. And for the first time in history, all three of those people are doing the same thing and pointed in the same direction. Uh, we add to that community supervision, probation and parole officers, uh, treatment professionals, both in the substance abuse world and in the mental health, behavioral health world. You have um, people coming out more in crisis if they don't get identified. If, you know, they go in, they could be victimized because they're in crisis and they're not acting rationally. Um, a lot of the times we have individuals that are identified and we, we recognize them, we could get them stable on their medication, but then when they come out, we could be kind of fall through the cracks and that's what we try and prevent so that they can at least meet up with them. We have a specific officer that handles all the mental health clients and that, that's been successful. Juvenile program serves um, several different populations. We have a family treatment court, which is an accountability court for parents with substance use issues. We also serve delinquent youth and unruly youth, which is now considered TIN. We have all kinds of services, programs, um, assessments to figure out what the families need and how better to serve them. My responsibility is to deal with all of the kids who come into foster care for uh, unfortunate reasons um, from zero to three years old, meaning from birth until three years old. And what that involves is dealing with children who have been prenatally exposed to substance use while their mother was pregnant, uh, dealing with kids who are in uh, need of services for developmental needs, such as speech therapy, physical therapy, uh, children who have behavior problems with regulating their emotions as well. Douglas County also has community groups and nonprofits working together to help the community face behavioral health challenges. The state of Georgia is very blessed to have one of the unique organizations that's called Family Connections. And Family Connections is an umbrella for the entire state. Every county has its own unique organization with its own unique name. And what we do is focus on the needs of uh, our families, our young, young people and the things that we have to deal with. In Douglas County, it's called CORE, and that stands for Communities Organizing Resources for Excellence. The purpose of CORE is to find out where are we a healthy county? Where are the areas that we have needs? And this is where Family Connections comes in. They get all of the data. They let us know the different areas that we need to work on. What areas are we doing well in and we need to continue with? So its purpose is really an overall value for our families. And so if I'm experiencing a mental health concern, that's going to potentially impede my ability to perform those roles of being a mother. Um, you know, I've done a lot of in-home therapy as well, working with children. I've, I'm a child, I've done a lot of child therapy as well. And oftentimes when parents are unable to serve in that parental role, you know, usually there is a mental health concern as well as a substance use issue. What impact does that have on children? And so Kaiser Permanente and the CDC, they've done a study looking at how child, how adversity experienced during childhood, adverse childhood experiences, uh, ACEs for short, how does that impact, of course, their um, uh, uh, risk-taking behaviors? And of course, it's also related, if you have that adversity during childhood, how is that related to um, your risk-taking behaviors? Fit for the Future is a community development group, and our objective is to actively engage the community on a daily basis. 
So we host a number of different community engagement activities, programs, and initiatives that work within the community to be able to bring people together. Our big focus is unity in our community. Yeah, what I've seen is that um, a lot of the young people in our community are using, um, especially with drug abuse and substance abuse, is using those as coping mechanisms in order to um, deal with the stress and the pressures of their age group and the reality of the world that they live in. So I feel that um, I feel that it has negatively affected them because they they aren't using holistic approaches to be able to deal with the mental health issues that we all deal with. I think that mental health is something that every single person deals with, but the way that we handle it, I feel that that's the issue and that's where substance abuse comes in. The Douglas County Community Services Board envisions and works to provide every Douglas County citizen with access to support and services that can assist with coping with behavioral health issues. The Douglas County Community Services Board is what's known here in Georgia as a Tier 1 safety net provider. We provide uh, all behavioral health core services, both mental health, outpatient, substance abuse courses, um, ASAM courses, as well as stable residential housing for individuals with a mental health diagnosis. The National Council on Behavioral Health states that any given community, about 14% of that population will suffer from serious and persistent mental health illness within a given year. Um, on average right now, Douglas County uh, Community Services Board services about 5,000 of our citizens annually. Douglas County Community Services Board, we provide services such as individual therapy, group therapy, family counseling, uh, medication assistance uh, for individuals who can't afford their prescriptions, um, case management, addictive disease support. Uh, we help individuals get phones, identification cards, um, and we also do diagnostics. Now let's hear some behavioral health success stories in Douglas County. We've had about uh, eight individuals that have graduated from the program, and um, both male and female graduates. And uh, I'm most proud of being able to get to know the participants on another level as a judge. Uh, normally I don't get to talk to individuals that come before me, find out about their family lives, and really delve into who they are as a person. And so we have uh, stories about, uh, you know, individuals who are musicians and artists and poets. Uh, and I'm most proud of our graduates, but I'm uh, also most proud of seeing them discover themselves. CORE has been blessed the last two years. Our Board of Commissioners has given us funds where we've been able to actually help some individual families that would not have had the money in order to get the help they needed, but also to set up education. And not only for the public, but for our professionals. So putting funds into it, it affects every part of our community. I had a student who started with me, he was seven years old, and um, he was very, had a, dealt with a lot of mental health issues, had lost his mother um, early, and also lost his grandmother early. Um, unfortunately, he was actually there when they were murdered, unfortunately. Um, and so he had to deal with that. And so, of course, as a seven-year-old, or well, as a five-year-old dealing with that, it causes for a lot of mental health issues. But um, he got into our program at the age of seven, and he was adopted into a foster home at the age of seven. And when he started our program, he was very ballistic in the point, to the point where you couldn't touch his shoulders, you couldn't really touch him because he just had PTSD and different things like that. But now this young man is actually a star student at Chapel Hill Middle School. He just made the seventh grade basketball team. He has all A's and B's, and he's doing phenomenal now. I recently heard from someone who was on my caseload as a teenager several years ago, reached out to me through Facebook to let me know that he was doing well. The father has children now. Just kind of letting me know how all of that affected him as a teenager in a positive way. We had an individual that we were servicing that um, actually was experiencing homelessness. Um, his backstory is that his actual wife and daughter um, died in a vehicle accident, and he had no will to, to go forward anymore, so he basically lost his house, lost his job. Um, he came uh, here, started getting active treatment and help, uh, started working directly with some of our supportive employment coaches, and so now we'll tell you that he's a very prominent lawyer in Metro Atlanta today. Thank you for watching. We hope that this was informative 
and that it inspired hope that Douglas County is actively working together to address behavioral health concerns in our community. Thank you, everyone, for watching the video. I'm happy we could finally get it um, shown, and we will put it online for people to watch and for you to share. Once again, thank you to all of our panelists um, and our uh, communications team for getting the, uh, video, getting the video out, as, as well as showing the video and this program on DCTV23 and the Douglas County Happenings Facebook page. Uh, for more information on the Douglas County Behavioral Health Initiative, or anything pertaining to Douglas County, as always, you can go to CelebrateDouglasCounty.com. Thank you so much, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.